Yeah, so uh, I'm very happy to be here to present our work on monitoring health and behavior, uh, behavioral symptoms using AI and radio signal. So if you think about uh, some of the things that you struggle with as a doctor who works on, on mood disorders and uh, deal with your patients, one of the issues is that there are no effective biomarkers. And therefore, uh, most doctors rely on just asking the patient, asking the caregiver, how is the patient is doing? Um, are they sleeping well? Are they able to be like their behavior is normal? What is going on? And imagine if you can get a window to all of these questions while the patient is in their own home, but at the same time, without asking the patient to do anything, completely uh, non-obtrusive, completely uh, zero overhead. This is exactly the work that I, uh, I and my students work on. So basically, uh, I'm sure all of you guys have at home a Wi-Fi box. So what we worked on is something that looks very much like your Wi-Fi box, but it's smarter. We call it the Emerald box. It sits in the background of the home and it analyzes the electromagnetic waves around us. And from that, without touching the person at all, it can tell our sleep and sleep behavior. It can get our motion and how they are, we are moving with respect to the space where we are spending our time. It can get even interactions with caregiver and it can also get vitals like breathing and heartbeat. And the way we do it, as I said, is using advances in AI and machine learning, we analyze the electromagnetic waves in the environment in a touchless manner. So here you see a video, it's an illustrative video, wireless signals spread inside the home. They reflect of the human body because our bodies are full of water. And some of these reflections come back to our device, which analyzes them using machine learning. In this case, it would detect a fall and can alert the caregiver by a text email or, or phone message. I want to show you some examples from the home with real people. And first, let me show you examples with uh, our, in our lab, and then I'm going to move to actual patients. So here you see this person standing in one of the offices. Our device is going to monitor him from the adjacent office. So you see this big arrow. The device is in the adjacent office, and it's monitoring him through the wall. I want you to look at this red dot, which is the device understanding of where this person is. So let me play this. So as the person starts moving, you can see that the device recognizes that and it says the red dot is moving with him. And remember, we have no wearables on him. It's all purely based on how his body changes the electromagnetic waves around him as he moves. And we are doing it from the adjacent office. The device is not even in the same office. Now, of course, this gives you something called gait speed, which is a very important metric for understanding a variety of diseases as well as understanding uh, fatigue. And we compare the motion to a vital motion capture uh, device, which is a full room that is equipped to measure exactly where the motion is, and the accuracy is 98%. But once you have this metric, now you can start asking, what else can I get? I mean, I can get the gait of the person and how they are moving. But actually, when you think about movement in the home, it actually also tells you a lot about the behavior. So you can ask questions that are related to eating and toileting, like it helps. Basically, how often the person goes to the kitchen and gets close to the fridge, how often do they enter the bathroom? You can ask a question about behavioral questions. So, for example, is the patient just waking up, sitting in bed the whole day, not leaving, having showing withdrawal uh, behavior? Or are they very sedentary? They just wake up and sit on a couch and watch TV the whole day. We can also monitor sleep. So sleep, as we know, as we go to sleep, our brain waves change and we enter different stages, awake, light sleep, deep sleep, and REM. And these sleep stages are, of course, very important to sleep disorders, but they are also important to a variety of diseases, particularly mood disorders. So, for example, one of the things that is known is that uh, in depression, for example, one of the things that tend to happen is that REM starts happening early on during sleep. Now, again, there are also all that we all know, for example, about anxiety and stress that affect 
how like when people fall into sleep and how how much they are able to sustain sleep so can we get this uh, at home easily so today if you want to get accurate sleep staging you have to send somebody into the sleep lab and they put all of these sensors on their head and body and they ask them to sleep like this let me show you what we can do so here is our device. We transmit very low power wireless signal, uh, analyze the reflection using AI algorithm. And from that, we can get the sleep stages. Not only we can get whether the person is asleep versus awake, but also we can get, for example, when they enter REM and how much REM they are getting. And uh, we compare this with FDA approved devices for, for sleep staging uh, that are based on EEG signal and the accuracy is 80%. And when I say 80%, I mean, if you divide the time into 30 second epochs and you look at the accuracy of the individual 30 second epoch, 80% of those are labeled accurately. And effectively, this is comparable to consistency across different sleep technicians. So this is really high. We can also monitor uh, respiration, like you are sitting there and similarly to this guy, and what you see on the screen is nothing but his inhales, exhales. We ask him to hold his breath and you see the signal stays at a steady level because he exhaled, he did not inhale. And again, we compare to FDA approved devices. In this case, it's a chest, bent, uh, chest belt from uh, Philips that the person has to wear. Now, over the past two years, we have been uh, working with doctors and uh, healthcare professionals in variety of diseases, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and others. And I'm going to show you some of uh, some of the data with uh, with actual patients. So before that, this is actually our device, as you can see on the wall, is very non-obtrusive and the patient doesn't have to do anything. They just go on about living their life and the device just collect information about their health. So I'm going to show you data from a Parkinson's study. And this is done with the University of Rochester, Dr. Ray Dorsey. And uh, as part of a big NIH center, we are collecting data about Parkinson's disease. And I'm just going to show you an example here, illustrative example to understand the, the power of being able to capture this kind of data. So what you see here is uh, one Parkinson patient. This is his space of living. And this uh, green box here at the top is our device. The blue curve that you see is two hour of motion of that patient, like the trajectory of that patient. And as you can see, it moves between the bed. He's, he likes to sit on this chair. This is like kind of like a kitchenette area, it goes to the bathroom, etc. So we take all of these trajectories and try to understand the um, behavior and the life of this person. And this is a graph that we get for this particular person. So let me explain this graph. Each circle of this graph is one day. The top uh, at the top, you see zero, this is midnight. At the bottom, you see 12, this is noontime. And every circle is one day. The innermost circle is the first day of the monitoring. The outermost circle is the last day of the monitoring. This is two months period. Now, blue is the time when he is in bed asleep. And as you can see, for example, if you look at the blue, you see that at the beginning of the monitoring period, the blue is very fragmented, very poor. So his sleep was really bad. And then as we progress towards the outer circles, the later days in the experiment, we see that the blue starting to consolidate, so his sleep has improved significantly. We know in Parkinson's sleep is one of the problems. Now, the other thing that you can see here is that the graph is full of green. Green is the time when he's sitting on a chair. So as you can see, this person basically sleeps, wakes up, sits on a chair most of his time very sedentary life, which is problematic. The other thing that you can see in this graph is you see a, a cone of yellow at 8 a.m. in the morning, so where my cursor is, between 6 and 9, there is this cone of yellow. Yellow refers to when he goes to the bathroom for his toileting and showering. So one of the things that you can immediately see that this is a person who, like, the blue stops around 4 a.m., he sits on a chair for until 8 a.m. and then he do his, his toileting and, and showering at 8 a.m. 
like the natural thing to ask why this person wakes up, sits on a chair until 8 a.m. to do his toileting and showering. And the reason is because actually he's unable to do his toileting and showering on his own. So he's waiting for the house worker who comes around 8 a.m. in the morning to help him with taking his shower. So what you can see is just by having some box that looks very much like a Wi-Fi box, but is smarter, without asking any question, we have an understanding of many aspects of this person's life. We also worked on understanding agitation in, with, in people that have Alzheimer's. And this is actually a study that we did in, with McLean, uh, with, um, uh, with Dr. Ipset Vahia from McLean. So one of the things that we were looking at is uh, agitation in people and how we can generate uh, digital biomarkers of agitation. And we came up with this idea that repetitive behavior can be a, uh, a sign or a marker of agitation. So let me show you this uh, particular person here. <clears throat> so this red dot here is the patient. And what this patient is, going, you're gonna show, that you're gonna see her, I'm gonna play this video and you will see her going inside her bedroom, getting to the bed and then leaving the bed and going out. And then again, getting in and going out, getting in and going out, the spacing behavior between the bed and outside the bedroom. So let me play this video for you. She gets to the bed, she leaves again. She go in, leaves again. I sped up the, the video a bit so that you can see, get in, get out. So this is the person in her 80s. If you count the number of times she does this repetitive behavior, here is what you get. So on the X axis of the day, the bars are referring to how many times she had these pacing episodes. And you can see on certain days, it varies between 100 times to like about 300 times. And again, remember like an 80 year old, 80 plus going back and forth, back and forth 300 times. So what this allowed us to do is to quantify her pacing behavior and that helps the doctor understand and attend to that behavior better. I want to mention, uh, lastly, uh, one result from our COVID monitoring. And again, this is with Dr. Uh, Ipsed Vahia from McLean. So in COVID, uh, patients are asked to stay in quarantine. And during that time, the, the recovery period can go smoothly or you can have problems. So what we did is to help assisted living community monitoring their patient during the quarantine period in COVID-19 to understand the behavior during uh, the recovery period. So now, of course, Breathing is very important. And one of the things that you can see, and that was common across all patients, is basically at the beginning, you see like here, you see one patient on April 7, and you see her inhales, exhales. And then you see the same thing on April 11. And clearly you can see that the breathing signal, uh, the breathing rate went down and decreased and became much closer to her baseline. Now, breathing is very underused uh, biomarker, what we discovered, and effectively that it allows us to see different behavior and different recovery behavior in these patients. So this is a patient who ended up uh, being re-hospitalized re -hospitalized during recovery. So let me explain this. Every one of these blue curves is the breathing histogram during one day. Now, during the first week, you see the breathing histogram is shifting toward 15 breaths per minute, away from 20 breaths per minute. Now, on April 14, suddenly the breathing rate increases. And indeed, on this day, the patient ended up in the hospital. Now, the patient spent one week in the hospital. When she came back, again, you see her breathing rate decreasing again, and eventually she recovered. So what we saw in our data, in our population, three types of behavior, patients that actually their recovery went through a hiccup and they ended up being re-hospitalized, patients whose recovery was smooth, and although their breathing rate started high, they actually gradually moved back to the baseline, and asymptomatic patients whose just their breathing behavior was the same all the time. Now, after the, the COVID quarantine ended, we started looking at behavioral differences between during the post-COVID period 
And um, this is my last slide. So I just want to give you a high level idea of what we are doing here. This is a graph similar to the graph that I showed you. But what you see is the difference in behavior between these patients. So patient one is very much into a routine, sleeps at exactly the same time, wakes up around the same time. And then he's like green is the time that he spent on the chair. For example, he is uh, using a particular chair and you can see that this behavior is very regular across days. You see patient two, very irregular behavior when they go to sleep, when they sit to eat, when they don't. It's, and what we notice is that the more irregular the behavior, the more the patient has anxiety and the more showed uh, also in this case, these are older patient cognitive impairment. So with this, let me end by saying really what we are looking for is uh, this new device called Emerald and that allows us to move from wearables and uh, asking the patient to do things or provide subjective information to something that is completely invisible and have the uh, be able to get access to behavioral biomarker and vital signs without uh, asking the patient to change their behavior or to do anything. I will stop here and thank you very much.